after Easter, we try to do a small topical series. And uh, for this series, we're going through the guiding principles of the church. And if you see in these booklets that we gave you, uh, the first part of the booklet goes through uh, some of the why plant a church in, or why start a new church is another way of saying that here in Providence. And if you don't know, we, we're a church that has only been going uh, along for about a year and a half. So we just celebrated our second Easter, and it's been an exciting process. So that gives some of the reasoning. And if you keep on turning, you'll get to our guiding principles. So a page for each one. We're going to start at the first one of Scripture. And the QR codes, I'll, I'll warn you right now, the QR codes are not working yet, but they will be. Hopefully, progressively, as we go through the series, the QR codes will work as you uh, pull it up. And then on our website, there'll be more resources. So if you're like, I want to dive deeper into that, there'll be book recommendations, sermons, videos that will help you dive deeper into each of the guiding principles. And the reason why we're doing this is... God said, or Jesus said in Matthew that he will build his church. He will build his church. And God uses a certain amount of material, certain types of material to build, like any builder, to build his church. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I try to do things around my house and building around in my house. And my, as my dad would always say, you know, why do it right when you can do it yourself? That's the way it is. <laughs> in my house. You know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to try this. But occasionally I'll call somebody else in and they'll do it. And I'm always just amazed by one, how quickly they do it and how it's significantly better than what I would have done. And all just the, the material they use and how they know, they know what to do. And the same thing goes for the church. Like we can try to invent ways of building the church, but that doesn't work. God has given us certain ways of building certain materials that need to be used, and you really can't make that up. So as a church, in our gutting principles, we don't want to just say, okay, this is what we really value. It really doesn't matter what we value. We want to we want to align ourselves with what God says. We want to align ourselves with what God said, I'm going to build my church with this. So as best as we can, through prayer and through studying the Word of God, these eight principles are really trying to be a shorthand for what God has already communicated in his word. Shorthand for what God says, I care about this, I work with this, this is the material I use. And the first one is scripture. So out of reverence for God's word, let's stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to be in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is the word of God. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would guide us. We ask that you would chain us, we, change us. We ask for all these things that your word says here, they would be true of us. We'd be reproved, corrected, trained, taught, complete. And we know it's only by your word that this happens. It's only by your grace that this happens. We ask for it now. Amen. You may be seated. My grandmother was a very faithful Christian. And one of the things that I got when she passed away, in fact, I think it's the only thing that I got when she passed away, was this red Bible. And it sits next uh, in my, I have a, an office in my house, and it sits right next to my uh, desk. It's red and all tattered. And, but my favorite thing about it is opening up, and I see these writings from, that my grandma wrote at the, at the back and the front of the Bible and throughout, if you, as you flip through, just little notes that she has in the margins. And it means a lot to me, being able to read my grandmother's handwriting. And as I was preparing for this, I flipped it to the back, and you know I've forgotten what she wrote. I've probably read it a number of times. But in the back, there were just fears that she was having at the time. And she just wrote out different fears that she had. So the, the fear of losing loved ones, the, 
the fear of getting old, the fear of, and she just write out all these fears. And then she wrote how God was greater than those fears. And just reading that from my, and, and not just the truth of it, but just in the hand of my departed grandmother in the back of her Bible, it meant a lot. It meant a lot just reading that. And I know that if right now, if I pull that out of my back pocket an envelope with writings from someone, uh, one, one of your loved ones or someone you really care about, they're like, a week before they passed, they wrote you this letter. I know you would, you'd run up and take it and be like, I'm sure the sermon was going to be great, but not that great. And you'd leave and you'd read it. You'd rip it open and you'd read it because you'd want to know what they had to say. You desperately just cling on to those words of like, what did they have to say to me? Now, as Christians, and I know not everyone here is a Christian. I know a lot of you are just here and you're checking things out and you're trying to figure out what do I actually believe. But what Christians believe is that we have something written by God given to us. A book written by God. Or to be more, a little bit more accurate, 66 books compiled and written by God, given to us. Different genres, different times of history, written over hundreds of years, collected, published, printed now, and we have it here. And in the same way that you would just rip open the envelope to see what your loved one has to say, we should have the same type of anticipation, the same type of longing, the same type of, I'm just going to cling to every word when it comes to the word of God. If we truly believe that God wrote a book, that's the type of anticipation we should have. And even more so, because although I loved my grandmother dearly and she was very wise, she wasn't perfect. And her words weren't perfect. And God is immensely more wise and perfect in his understanding and his words. And he has communicated to us. So we're going to look at four things when it comes to the scriptures. What, what is it? What, you know, what, do we, what do we mean when we say God wrote a book? What is the nature of this? There are four things to this. The authority of scripture, the necessity of scripture, the sufficiency, and the clarity of scripture. The first thing is the authority, the authority of scripture. You can learn a lot about people by just going to a playground. If you want to learn a lot about human nature, just go to the local playground and watch kids play, okay? Bring a kid. It'll make it less weird for the parents. Like, who's the stranger <laughs> at the playground? So bring a kid and then watch, and you'll learn a lot about human nature. And one of the things you'll learn is the way humans morally reason. So, for example, you, that one kid's throwing rocks and it, it, the rocks are getting really close to other kids. One of the kids might walk up and say, stop throwing rocks. And what will happen on a lot of playgrounds, I'm not saying exactly the time that you're watching, but what will happen often is this common phrase will come up. Who says? Okay? And you just, you just go to your playground. I, I guarantee that if you watch intently enough over a long enough period of time with a group of kids, you'll hear that phrase, who says? You stop doing that, who says? And what that is, is just in our nature, is we know that if there's not an authority that says, I don't have to do it. If there's not an authority that speaks into this, I'm free to do whatever I want. It's an appeal to authority. We know that a moral claim really doesn't matter unless there's an authority backing it up. So they'll say, well, the teacher or my mom or your mom or whatever it is. They'll, they, you need, in order for it to have some weight, you need to answer that question. And this is why without really understanding authority, without really having a grasp of, of authority, you'll never have an objective moral standard. People will, will try to substitute it with something. Well, the law says, you know, or something like that. But has the law ever been wrong? In fact, is our current law perfect? N no. And although I, I would say, just for the record, obey the law. Okay, okay just, for, just you can go away with that. But is our law currently perfect? No, but not even close. Not even close. Or you might say, a parent. Well, mom says, dad says, grandma says, grandpa says, whatever it is. Now, they might be great mothers. They might be great fathers. But are they perfect in their understanding of what is ethically right? Certainly not. 
or people say, I think, or I feel. Now, they might be right in what they think or they feel, but do people think wrong things on occasion? <laughs> yeah, a lot. Do people feel wrong things on occasion? A lot, yes. Like Those things are not objective realities that you can hang your hat on when it comes to a, a moral understanding. The says who question, even for a kid, even just for a five-year-old, they understand is a very important question. So the says who for Christians is, well, God says. Well, God says. And if someone's like, how do you know what God says? Well, he wrote a book. It says here in 2 in Timothy 3, it's like that is an objective reality. God says. There's something backing up moral claims. And this is what this verse in 2 Timothy is, is saying. It says, all scripture, so from beginning to end, all scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out is, uh, is referencing Genesis 1 and 2, in which God created everything by his word. Speaking is a form of breathing. They, come, they happen instantaneously. It's and he gives his word, and he creates everything out of his power. He gives reality and truth. So all scripture is breathed out by God. And then Paul, the writer, he wrote a letter to his disciple Timothy. He writes this letter, and then he lists four things in which scripture does. And when communicated, it does four things. The first thing he says is that it's good for teaching. For teaching. Have you ever been going about doing something and you're like, or this is what happens to me. You're assembling something from Ikea or something you got from the store and you're like, I don't need the instructions. And you start it and <laughs> you, you realize about halfway through that you did need the instructions. So you have to disassemble everything and then you go back. And what are the instructions going to do? They're going to teach you. That's the way life is. Sometimes we are dumb and stupid, and we need to be taught. And that's, there's a difference between someone who knows what to do and doesn't do it or some, and someone that is completely ignorant to reality, and they, go, they are walking in that ignorance. Sometimes we're just ignorant. We do not know. So we need to be taught. We need to learn. And the scriptures do that. They teach the ignorant. They inform the foolish. The other thing the scriptures do is it says, and for reproof, and for reproof. Sometimes we're driving down the road and we start to veer off to the right or veer off to the left. Have you ever been driving and you start to get tired? You start to get tired and you're just nodding off a little bit and you nod off and you wake up and your, your car, the trajectory of the car is to go into the ditch. Or you, you wake up because your car hits the gravel on the side or the speed, the speed bumps on the side and, and it wakes you. It's like that's the way we are in life. As we start to veer off, and what the scriptures do is they reprove. Get, get back on. No, that's too much to the right. That's too much to the left. We are prone to extremes as people. We are prone to go all the way to the right or all the way to the left. And the scriptures are like, no, 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 not that far. Right here. Stay on the road. And then it says, in correction. Not only do we veer off to the right or the left, sometimes we are driving right down the middle, but going the wrong way. There was one time, <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to say this. There was one time when we were, uh, we were dating, we were driving actually here to Providence for the first time, visiting her family. Really scary trip, <laughs> Okay. And we, we weren't married, so we're like, we're driving all the way through. We're not going to stop anywhere. We're driving all the way through. And I was driving as, as much as I could. And I'm like, I just need to sleep for a little bit. So could you drive for, for a little bit? And uh, the reason why I'm laughing is there's some discrepancy about some of the details of the story. But so I, I go to sleep, and I wake up, and she's been driving for an hour or two, and Turns out we were driving the wrong way down the highway. Got, got back onto the highway, driving the wrong way. Sometimes that happens in life. 
And what do you have to do? You have to be corrected. You have to turn around and drive back the other way. That happens. And what the scriptures do is they correct us. You're, try, you're going the exact wrong way. Go the other way. And then it says, and trains. And trains. Do you need to be trained? Do you look into the future of life and you think, there's no way I know what to do. There's no way I have the strength to do that. God, I don't know if this is what, like how in the world am I going to ha have the power to do that? And, and God's like, I want to train you. I want to I want to teach you what you need to know. So you're equipped that when you get into the ring, get into the ring of life, you're ready. You know what to do. All the scriptures do all of these things. And then it says that the man of God and using man the way we use mankind. So all people, he's writing to a man, but it's in a, in a general sense, all people, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Complete and equipped for every good work. We come to the word of God incomplete. You know, we come to the word of God incomplete, and the word of God completes us. The assumption is we are not complete. The assumption is when you look into the mirror, you should be like, I'm a work in progress. Okay? And if you realize that, that's the first step, realizing that. And the second step is going to the word to become complete. Being equipped, complete, completed by God. And then it says equipped for every good work. Equipped for every good work. So this means that the Word of God meets the need for absolutely everything that you could uh, come to in life. Everything. So the authority is not just authority when it comes to moral principles. It is. The authority is not just authority when it comes to how I should live as individuals. The authority is not just uh, pertinent that if you're writing up public policy for a group. It's, it's pertinent for everything that could be done and good in life. It doesn't mean that it addresses everything. Like, for example, um, it doesn't address um, what you should do on the Internet or not. The Internet's not addressed because it wasn't invented yet. But principally, it addresses everything. Not in every, every specific of everything in life, but principally it addresses everything and it has authority over every area of life. So that you go into life and there's nothing that the Bible doesn't speak into. There's nothing that the scriptures don't speak into. There's nothing that God's word. I mean, you're using all three of those terms, scriptures, God's word, um, at the Bible, synonymously. It speaks into everything. It has authority over everything. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it's necessary. If it has authority over everything... By its very nature, it will be necessary. Does anyone ever accidentally uh, skip a meal? Maybe you, you forget to pack lunch, and you're like, oh, man, I don't have lunch. Or sometimes I'll get to Bolt Coffee. I'll often meet uh, people at Bolt Coffee. I'll get there in the mornings, and I'm starting I'm drink one cup. I'm like, I should get another cup. And I, drink, and I get on my second cup. And by the time I'm like halfway through my second cup, I bring, I'm bringing it up and I just notice my, my, it's like, I'm oh man, I'm getting kind of jittery. I'm gonna, my stomach's rumbling a little bit. And I realize I forgot to eat breakfast. And now I'm drinking coffee on an empty stomach and my body is starting to, to react. It's like, this, this will happen or if, if you skip lunch, you forgot to pack a lunch, so you just work through lunch. And you'll notice your body just feels weak, feels worn down, starts to react in certain ways. We, you need food. I'm going to say something very, I think everybody can understand this point. You need food to live. You need food. It's necessary. So with that, you know, that obvious understanding in mind, Jesus says this in Matthew 4, verse 4. But he answered, it is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he quotes the Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures of the Jewish people, and he says, it's written. 
this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's making the same type of argument. It's like you need the word to live in the same way that you need food to live. You think you can just go about life and, and not consume food? We'll see. We'll see. Let's wait and see how it goes. And what, if you try, what you'll realize is just how frail you are. You're very frail. You're, you're, you do not have strength. You do not have power. You do not have what you need. You just keep on going and you'll realize it very quickly. And the same reality is true when it comes to our souls in the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God to nourish us to uh, give us uh, power and strength to do absolutely everything in life. That's what we need. We need it. And if we don't, if we don't, there'll be massive consequences, massive consequences. And the sad thing is, is we often don't notice how much we need it because we are used to, uh, we're, we're used to our souls being starved. We're used to it, so we don't realize what is actually there. I've shared this analogy before, but um, I think it, it connects. Of I used to not ever, I used to never eat breakfast. And sometime in my twenties, I started. You know, I'm like, oh, they say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I don't know if that's actually true, but I started to eat breakfast, and I noticed that once I started, and it was a habit. If I skipped, I could feel it by lunch. I'm like, oh, man. Now, the, that reality, the not having the energy, not having, that was already a reality before I started eating breakfast. The thing is, is I didn't notice it was a reality until I started. You'll notice this, that if you start going on a diet and like, I'm going to eat salads, you know, okay? And you're whatever, you're, you're eating clean and you do that for a few months. And then you go back to eating fried food for a few days. And then you're like, your body, you're just like, oh, you know, you, you just feel like I, you just feel like you have this weight on your shoulders and you're just walking around with it. It's my stomach. What's going on with my stomach? The, the reality is it was already like that. But because you've been eating clean for two months, now you're aware of the way it was. You're aware of the way it was. It's that way with the Word of God. You actually don't realize how much you need it until you start reading it and start understanding it and start applying it. And then you take a break and you'll notice it immediately. What's going on? Or an, another thing, notice in 2 Timothy 3, it says all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture. Sometimes people will be like, but Pastor, I do read the Bible every day and I still feel like my soul is malnourished. I still feel like I don't have the strength. Well, one of the answers could be, I'm not saying this is true every single time, but one of the answers could be is you just read Philippians over and over and over again. Or you just read the Gospels over and over and over again. It says all Scripture. You guys know what scurvy is? Scurvy? It's known, it was like the disease. You can put the, pic, the picture up there. Okay, there we go. This is... It was, it was the thing that pirates would get. It's when you don't get enough vitamin C. Okay, when you don't get it. And pirates would get it because they'd be out in C without vitamin C. There you go. That's okay. It, it would be, and, and what would happen is their teeth would start falling out. They'd get very pale. And their eyes would become sunken. And it is not a good look. It looks like a pirate. That's what it looks like. It's like, it's not, it's not good for you. Because you're not, they, would they be eating? Yeah, certainly they'd be eating. But they wouldn't be getting all of the different vitamins that they need. So their body would be reacting to that. And this can happen in a lot of different ways. You know, this is what nu nutritionists will point out. Like, hey, well, you need the, more iron. You know, the reason why you feel very weak is you need more iron in your diet. Whatever it is. Well, this is the way it works with the scriptures. That if you only just go back to the same place over and over and over again, you're not getting the micronutrients that you need holistically to be healthy. A big red, red alert that goes off in my mind is when someone, they've been a Christian for a while, 
and you reference a book, and they're like, oh, I haven't read that one yet. And I'm like, oh, no. And the reason why that alarm goes off in my mind is I know there's some spiritual scurvy that's probably going on. So there's some spiritual scurvy that's going on. Because the, all of the scriptures nourish us. All of it. And it's, it's like, I'm just going to cut out, I look at the food pyramid and I'm like, I'm just going to cut out the vegetables, you know? It's like, and just think nothing's going to happen. You know, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. We need all of it. So expose yourself to all, now, I know for a lot of people here, you're just getting, you're getting into it for the first time. Just start, just start. But if it's been years and years and years and years, you've been reading the Bible, make sure you're getting a balanced diet. All of it, because it's necessary. It's necessary. The third thing is it's sufficient, the sufficiency of Scripture. You might be like, okay, it's important. I need it to nourish all of my life. But what about the things that I know aren't in the Bible? You mentioned how the Internet's not in the Bible. Like, how, how I'm trying to decide what major I should be in college. I'm, just, I'm trying to decide whether I should move into a different career path. I'm trying to decide whether to ask out Susie or Barb or whatever whatever it is. Who should I? I don't know why I went for the oldest names possible. Okay, it's like, or whatever it is. It's like, uh, like what? Uh, what about the specifics? What about the specifics? Well, it's also sufficient for the specifics. This is what it says in in Psalm one nineteen one. It says, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. The psalmist is saying that if you want to be blameless before God, this is all you have to do. Just do what God has said. Okay. Now, do do we do that? Does anyone do that? The answer is no. That's why we need a Savior. But... The principle is still true. If you just want to be blameless, all you have to do is what God has said. So if he didn't say, be a nurse, (laughs) doesn't mean you're going to stand before God on judgment day and God is going to say, you're supposed to be a nurse. (laughs) No, that's not going to happen. Because he didn't say that. He said, love your neighbor. He said, love God. Lord, you God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The word of God is absolutely sufficient for all of life. That if you just obey it, you'll be blameless. Or here's another passage from uh, Peter. In 2 Peter 1, it says, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises. His divine power is granting everything we need for life and godliness. Okay, now what does that cover? Life and godliness. It covers all of life and all of what it looks like to be like God in all of life. There is no exceptions. So choosing a profession, is that part of life? Yes. Choosing a spouse, is that a part of life? Yes. Choosing what to name a kid, is that a part of life? Yeah, choosing to have kids, is that a part of life? Everything you need for life and godliness through his, his precious promises, which are found in his word. All of life and godliness is covered. So it is sufficient for all of life. No exceptions. Now, does this mean that God doesn't lead through the prompting of his spirit? No, it, it obviously means that. How do we know? We see that in God's word. Does this mean that he doesn't lead through his providence, meaning the situation, sometimes you're just in the right place in the right time? Oh, of course he leads like that. How do we know? From his word. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's how we know that he does that. Does this mean that he, he doesn't lead through the wise counsel of other people in your life? No, he does. How do we know that? From his word. His word tells us that he leads that way. But it all comes back to, we, we know those things. We know his word is sufficient. Because his word says it's sufficient. There was one time I was meeting with a pastor uh, in Bristol. Yeah, we were at a coffee shop in Bristol, and we you were just when two pastors get together, it's usually it can it's usually good. But then you can kind of get into a place of like, have you ever had this? 
oh yeah, it's like you start just talking about different situations, and we we got talking about different situations about how people make decisions, how people make decisions, and we're walk, at this time we're walking out to the car. We finished coffee, we're walking out to the car, and we're like, oh, people will do this. People will look at a license plate and just make a decision based off of a, a license plate. And we're laughing, and we're like, and he said something like, they might as well just go to a. a someone to have a crystal ball read to them or whatever. And we're laughing. It's like, because it's true. It's like so superstitious, looking at a license, whatever. So I get in my car and I drive to Seven Stars on Hope Street to meet with somebody. And I come in, I'm a little bit late. Hey, sorry, I'm late. And he's like, you won't believe what just happened. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, two cars in front of me, pulled in front of me, license plate, Utah. Can you believe it? Utah, twice. And he, he pulled out his phone he took pictures, the license plate, to Utah. And he moved to Utah about a month later. <laughs> Just like that. And that's how often, and now that's an extreme exam, an example. But it's like, people will make decisions like that. And again, I do think God uses situations. I do think he uses his own providence. And sometimes things are like, wow, that was just right in front of me at the right time. That does happen. But I say all of this to say I think for a lot of people, they're looking up into the clouds when the answer is right in front of them. It's like God has actually communicated that. It's, it's actually not a mystery what God thinks about that. And there'd be so much more clarity, so much more clarity, if we just understood the sufficiency of the Scriptures, what God says. The last thing we see is the clarity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture. You might be like, you know, well, even if it is sufficient, I've tried to read it, and I don't know what it's saying. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what it's saying. It's, it's a hard book to understand. Well, this is what it says in Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus says later that this is the most important commandment. Okay, so all scripture is, is from God, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all scripture is of the same importance. Jesus himself said, this is the most important. He raises this one up. Love all, God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So he gives the most important commandment ever. And then God leans towards parents and says, hey, teach them to your kids. Okay? So he leans, to, you know, you're, you're there and you're like, I'm 24. I don't know anything, but I have a kid. Yeah, teach it to your kids. It's, he leans towards, and ju just think, that's a large percentage of the population, and says, this is how I want this to be passed down. Well, I'm not equipped. Yeah, I think you are. The scriptures are clear enough that absolutely every person can understand them, at least when it comes to the main point. Okay? The scriptures are clear enough that every person can understand it, at least when it comes to the main point point. So I think the scriptures are clear enough that if you just started reading you, and you, you, you got through it and you understood the words, that you would know, okay, this is the main point of what's going on. This is the main point. Because they're, they're clear. They're clear. I don't, I don't think, although I think it's very important to have teachers, I think that you can understand it. You can understand it. So just get started. Just get started. Oh, one of the other reasons we know this is uh, Paul, when he writes these letters to the church, uh, Paul's an apostle, and he writes these letters to the early churches. And he says like, things like, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, meaning I'm writing to the, you guys in Corinth, and I expect you all to understand what I'm about to say. Or to the, the church of Galatia, which is a, a, a series of churches in a region of Galatia. It's like, I'm writing to you, and I expect you to understand what I'm saying. He does the same thing to his letter to Philippi. 
He doesn't say to the people that will understand and you can help all the dummies understand. He doesn't say that. He says to the church, meaning I expect you to understand. Now, this leads to a question. Does this mean that teachers aren't needed? That's not what the Bible teaches either. The scriptures are clear enough that everyone can understand, but God has also gifted others, both in their gifting and in their position, to teach and help everybody understand. So here's just one. There's a lot of passages about this, but here's just one. Not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Meaning there are those in the church that should teach, but there's a warning. You're going to be judged more strictly because what you're doing is everybody's supposed to understand and everybody is supposed to, to a degree, teach. And you're informing everybody's understanding and everybody's teaching. And that is a huge responsibility from God. But we're all supposed to understand. We're all supposed to teach, even though there are those, both in their gifting and position, that focus on it more. Another question people ask is, if the scriptures are clear, why do churches divide so much? If they're so clear, like you say, you know, it's, why there's so much division? You know, I, I passed by three churches on the way here. Why is there so much division? That is a very good question. Here, just a, a very quick response to that. Christians... First, Christians are not as divided as people think. For example, 99.9% of Christians in churches would affirm the Apostles' Creed, or the truths in the Apostles' Creed, even if they can't say the Apostles' Creed, the truths that are in the Apostles' Creed. Like Jesus was, uh, was God and also a man, and Jesus died for us. You know, it's like you just go through it. It's like that, people agree on that. And it doesn't, you know, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, everybody would agree on that. So on the most important things, we are very, very united. Well, then why are there divisions? Well, the second thing is Christians are, can be ignorant, wrong, and sinful. We can be ignorant, meaning we just don't know what it says. We can be wrong, as in we think we know, but we don't. And we can be sinful. We know what it says, but we don't like it. All those things are true about humans. So in that, the air is not with this. The air is with this. The air is here. Which brings us to the last point, again, what all Christians agree on. That Christians believe that Jesus saves sinners. If the air is not here, but here, well, God has something to say about that. In fact, he doesn't just have something to say. He did something about that. Christians believe that on the cross, Jesus dies for everything that we have done wrong. He receives the judgment that we deserve. And that by believing in him, you can have forgiveness. Now, certain traditions might add to that in a way I think they shouldn't. But all traditions would agree on that very statement. Jesus saves sinners. And that's the most important truth. So even in our division, even in our flaws, even in our ignorance and our lack of understanding, Jesus looks down and he still says, you know what? That's why I saved them. It just proves the point even more. Our divisions show a need for a savior. And that is crystal clear. Now, as an application, I'm going to end with some, some application. And in your booklet, you'll see different applications for uh, individuals, us as a community, and then also as a family, okay? So individual applications, community applications as a church, and then also as a family. So I'm going to go through those really quickly. The first one is as an individual. This is the application. This is a takeaway, a habit. You can just make a part of your life. Read and pray the Bible daily. Read and pray the Bible daily. Just put it in your schedule and make time for it. Here, here are a few, a few ways of doing it. Like, I've never done that before. Here, just get a Bible that is a translation you can understand. Get a Bible that is a translation you can understand. So I, I know for a lot of people, you might have a Bible at home that this, uh, that's a King James version. 
That's a great translation. But for a lot of people, the Old English, it was written, it's written in Shakespearean English. It's very hard to understand. So if you, if you don't like reading Shakespeare in your free time, it's probably not the best translation to start with. If you do, read it, read it up. It'll be great. Uh, so I, I teach out of the English Standard Version. Is it a good uh, translation? The Christian Standard Bible. All of them translating from the same Greek manuscripts, but translating it into a modern translation so we can understand it in modern English. So get a translation that you actually understand. First, set apart some time and read fast and slow. Read fast and slow. Meaning I would set, uh, set it a time where you read through maybe a few chapters. And then after reading through it, zoom in and read slow. I'll, I'll do this every day. I'll read what it, the chapters. I have a reading plan. I'll read through the chapters. And then I'll zoom in on a part that I really want to dwell on. Read fast and then read slow. Then I'd pray before and pray after. Pray for understanding before and then pray the text, both that you read quickly and the what you zoomed in on. Pray that after. And if it helps, this is something I don't think it's necessary, but it really helps me. If it helps to write out what you're reading, like maybe write some notes, or sometimes I'll just copy a verse into my journal just to slow down, do that. Slow down. Copy it out. And it helps you just process it. But read and pray the Bible daily. You know, this is an application a lot because I think it's so important. Man cannot live on bread alone. As a community, this is what we do. We gather weekly for expository preaching. Now, I know it's kind of ironic that I'm, I'm not, I didn't teach in a, um, an expository way this morning. I gave a lot of different verses to make a point, but usually we, we just teach through the scriptures. Now, expository, what, what this means is it means to teach the word and to teach what it says. Another word uh, is exegesis, which means to draw out meaning from the text. So as we teach through Acts this summer, we'll draw out the meaning from the text and say, this is what it says. Exposit it. Give it in front of people in a way that makes sense. And the opposite of that is reading meaning into the text. You're having a really bad day, and your boss is being mean or whatever, so you read the meaning of, you know what this is saying? This is saying that my boss is, you know, whatever. It's like, your boss is not mentioned. in the, It's like, you draw out the meaning from the text and clearly present it. And that's what we do every single Sunday. We draw, this is what it's saying. This is what God is saying to us. And we present it. This is what he was saying in the ancient time, in the ancient context. And this is what it's saying today. And we put it into practice. And the last thing is this. Have regular times where you worship God as a family. Have regular times as you worship God as a family. Whereas as a family, you, you open up the word of God and you say, this is what the Bible says to your kids. Like this is not, you're like, I don't know what to do. It's like, no, no, God knows. <laughs> God knows. It's like he, he, he gave you, he instructed you, and he'll give you the understanding. Just, just try. Do something. And if you were to ask, okay, I'm moving to another city. What kind of church should I, should I find? I'll end with this. I would say find a church that lifts these three things up. Hey, read the Bible. Today, when we get, gather as a group, we just go through the Word of God. As a family, open up the Word of God. Like, look, I don't care what tradition it is. I don't, I don't care if it's... Uh, Anglican, Lutheran, whatever, whatever it is. If they do that, go there. You might, you might be like, well, no church is perfect. Not every ch church does that. And like, well, the reason why I say that is no church is perfect. So if no church is perfect, that means that every church right now, including this one, needs to change. No church is perfect. Every church needs to change. Now, how would they know what to change? 
How would they know? They put themselves in a place where they're going through the word of God and they come to a verse and they're like, oh no, we need a change. That has happened to me many times. It's happened to me when I'm preparing to teach on Sunday. Coming to a verse, I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> it's like, that's how you change. Every church is imperfect, but every church is perfected by the word of God. So let's read it and cherish it and feed on it every single day. Let's pray.